Atheist Nomads, episode 104. News for July 23, 2015. Atheist Nomads is proudly brought to you by Archway Hosting. Check out their low price, full featured hosting solutions at archwayhosting.com. That's A R C H W A Y hosting.com. Hey, we're also brought to you by listeners just like you. Find out how you can become a patron at patreon.com forward slash atheist nomads. That's P A T R E O N dot com forward slash atheist nomads. As a concerned parent of the uh, free thought community, I want to advise uh, atheist nomad listeners that this is an adult show. There will be things discussed, talked about, topics that may be inappropriate for children under the age of 25, 40. 26, 27, yeah. 40. <laughs> We are the Atheist Nomads, bringing you history, science, politics, religion, and interviews with leaders in the atheist community. Not all those who wander are lost. Welcome to another episode of Atheist Nomads. This is episode number 104. I am Dustin. Joining me as always is Wesley. Hey, it's not as hot and my balls ain't sweaty. How you doing? Awesome, awesome. Uh, I'm doing all right. Uh, unfortunately, Lauren's not, so she's not joining us. Uh, her back is spasming. Holy shit. Yeah, yeah. Man, it's, yeah. you have back is- issues occasionally, too. Yeah, so yeah. Keeping it in the family there now. Mm-hmm. Yeah, and so, uh, but yeah, other than that, it's been it's been all right here. The uh, weather has been cooling down a little bit. Uh, daytime highs are now just in the the 90s which is normal for this time of year and only right okay yeah and got a, a awesome camping trip coming up here this weekend oh if i can i yeah C- keeping it local where are you going stan back to stanley again okay yeah there's a <laughs> area there lauren wants to check out she's uh trying to hunt down uh indigenous idaho carnivorous plants and there's right. a creek area that is supposed to have a bunch of them so we're going to check that out and Well, I'll be doing some fishing. Uh, She will probably also be doing some fishing, and we'll get to spend uh, two nights camped out in the Sawtooth Mountains. Very cool. Yeah. Yeah, And and how you been other than the, uh, you know, balls not sweating as much? (laughs) Man. uh, Well, vasectomy drama is finally basically over. Now I just got to wait a while to, you know, work everything out of the system and then uh go in and give a sample and get it all clear in like a month or so but uh, okay yeah so any guys out there wanting to do it they should totally do this shit you know have some say in your reproductive you know arena there but um oh my goodness anyway so oh goodness <laughs> all right uh let's go ahead and and jump into uh this episode's uh special topic creation mm. science Ooh, tasty. I've had a, a bit of education in this so-called creation science. It was covered occasionally in sermons and by guest speakers at churches in the areas I grew up in. And we had articles on the topic in the church publications routinely. And when I'd see Bill and I, the science guy, talk about evolution or millions of years, I'd tune it out and pray for him. Mm. In my middle school science class, we used textbooks produced by the Adventist Church covering creationist arguments against evolution. And in my high school biology class, we skipped chapter four of the state-mandated textbook, the one covering evolution. (laughs) The topic came up again a few times in some of my undergraduate classes, one even requiring the reading of Michael Behe's Darwin's Black Box. And then at the seminary, we had a class required for all MDiv students called Issues and Origins. And it was around the same time I was taking this class, actually it was at the same time I was taking this class that... I went on a uh, field trip for some extra credit in my archaeology of ancient Egypt class at the Field Museum in Chicago, and they had our evolving Earth as one of their exhibits. And I went through that and had my first comprehensive presentation of evolution where it finally seemed plausible. But back to the Issues and Origins class. Uh, It was team taught by a theology professor and a science professor who, if I recall correctly, was from the physics department. But I could be wrong about that. Uh, It was actually that class 
a creationist propaganda class that convinced me that evolution is correct. Why, you may ask? The most memorable part of the pro-creationist pieces was a lake in Colorado that conventional scientists had thought took 10 million years to form. Or fill, one or the other. And a creationist team managed to prove that it only took a few hundred years. What's the point of that victory? Hmm. Science is all about proving things wrong, so you can get it right. Hmm. Science is all about proving things wrong, so you can get it right. And compressing a quarter of a percent of the fossil record in one isolated location is completely irrelevant in the grand scheme of things. That was not convincing to me. Some of the other attempts at science are along the lines of trying to discredit fossil findings of hominids because they aren't complete or trying to claim that it's just deformities. There's also Behe's claims of irreducible complexity. He claims that there are structures that are not usable unless they are complete. For example, the human eye is pretty much useless if you remove any part of it, except for the fact that every single transitional form from no eye to our own eyes to even better eyes are all present and functional in some species that we have now. And that's really some of the best so-called creation science. Much of the rest of what you'll find is arguments that evolution is implausible, that it's mathematically unlikely, and that it's not intuitive. This, of course, is bullshit, since it's plenty plausible if you actually understand it. Mathematically improbable events only have to happen once, and evolution itself is is probable if you understand it. And aside from the difficulty people have intuitively thinking about time spans beyond their own lifespans, it's only implausible if you're already convinced that it's implausible. So what's it all boil down to? Worldview. If you believe that the Bible is the word of God and God said that he made the earth in six days, then it's easy to think that anything that disagrees is wrong. So arguments, evidence, and facts can't challenge it. Unless you, like me at the time, are questioning whether or not the Bible is the inerrant word of God and a reliable source of information. At that point, yes, arguments, evidence, and facts can successfully and effectively challenge creationism. You know, one of the things that I've always chuckled at when B. He talks about the eye is that uh, I've heard about a fish that actually has two sets of eyes, one that looks out and another set that looks like down. And, Hmm. you know, the fish could have just simply reused the eyes, but it developed an entirely different pair of eyes, you know, for different purposes. So, I mean, so you got a creature with like two sets of eyes, four eyeballs. Yeah. And, you know, both sets are totally different. I mean, why did it have to develop a new set, new set of eyes when it already had one? Exactly. Kind of weird. Unless there was some kind of a strong selective benefit. pressure. Yeah. 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 Huh. That's how it works. The fish that had the duplication of some eye genes that resulted in them in being on the bottom of its head, or the one that happened to have some cells that were just a little bit more sensitive to light, were the ones mm-hmm. that were more likely to survive. And living in a three-dimensional world like in the water, I'm actually surprised that's not more common. You know, (laughs) if you're able to see just a little bit of of light and differentiate, you know, what direction it's coming from, that's great. It's even better when you can focus on a little bit Mm -hmm. or, you know, get color. Uh, You know, know, there's tons of steps. There's tons of gradations and all of them are useful. And all of them are currently in use. I mean... You even have a few people, few, that are seeing into the ultraviolet. I don't know if that's probably a, well, suppo- supposedly they've actually done some some testing with them. Oh, well, one problem with with trying to test for uh, tetrachromacy is mm-hmm. you have to be able to develop tests that effectively test that, and that's a little bit hard if the people who are developing the tests are trichromatic. Hmm. Hmm. I mean, can't they just get a, a projection of, of light that, you know, just slowly creeps up the scale and then goes into ultraviolet and see if they can still see it? It's not that simple because all ultraviolet means is that it's past. Generally. Violet. Able to, yeah. And with the, the 
Tetrachromacy, I believe it's just a duplication of the blue receptor. Um, so they'd get to see, possibly see a little bit into the ultraviolet. Uh, what, mostly what they'd have, though, is just incredibly more complex and vivid uh, color vari- uh, variation. Uh, like you compare uh, trichromacy, which you know most of us have, to uh, a person who is colorblind is only bichromatic or like a dog or a cat and you've got blue and sartreuse. It's about all you can see. Just those two colors. Hmm. All right. Well, <laughs> the eye can definitely be useful no matter how much you can see. Anyways. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> all right. Ready for history? Sure. This day in history, July 23rd, 1982, the International Whaling Commission decides to end commercial whaling by 1985 or 86. Yeah. Anyways, uh, this was actually a, a long time coming and very sad that it took this long to happen. But uh, anyways, you know, a little bit of background here. The 1970s saw the beginning of the global anti-whaling movement uh you know greenpeace and a whole bunch of others definitely getting involved in this and um 1972 the united nations conference on the human environment in stockholm adopted a proposal that recommended a 10-year moratorium on commercial whaling to allow whale stocks to recover which still sounds gross to me man uh the reports of the convention on the international trade in endangered species in 1977 and 1981 identified many species of whales as being in danger of extinction. At the same time, a number of non-whaling and anti-whaling states began to join the IWC and eventually gained a majority over the whaling nations. Some countries who were previously uh, major whaling forces like the United States became strong proponents of the anti-whaling cause. I didn't even know the U.S. was big on this, at least recently. That's kind of gross. Mm-hmm. <laughs> but, yeah, on the 23rd of July, uh, members of the IWC voted, and by the necessary three-quarters majority, uh, they they passed it. So, uh, interestingly, f- uh, five abstentions, uh, which were Japan, Norway, Peru, and the former Soviet Union, now Russia. Uh, kind of gross. But anyway, so uh, Japan and Peru later withdrew, withdrew their objections. Uh, huh. We, The U.S. actually kind of forced their hands by threatening to reduce their fishing quota within U.S. waters if the rejection was not withdrawn. <laughs> uh, <laughs> yeah. But anyway, so... Uh, yeah, so hooray. Uh, now people just... You know, still have to pirate their their whale blubber if they want to get it. So, anyways, at least there's not a, a giant group that are trying to do this so much anymore. Okay. But, yeah, hooray, a, a, a big save for a lot of whales, even though they're still extremely endangered. Mm-hmm. And also still some countries that are engaged in whaling. And now a little tidbit. This day in 1984, Miss America resigns. Yeah, uh, this would be the day that Vanessa Williams gave up her crown as Miss America after pictures in Penthouse were published. Ooh. Wow. Yeah. Uh, first runner up and also, uh, another black lady, uh, Suzette Charles got Williams tiara for the two months that remained of her reign. But I'm moving on along this day in history. In 1995, the comet Hale Bop is discovered. Man, most awkwardly n- named comet ever is discovered. So, yeah, uh, interesting all around, actually. Uh, it was independently discovered by two observers, first one being Alan Hale and the second one being Thomas Bop, both of them from the United States. Uh, Hale was a. a Hale was a lover of, of uh, stargazing and an amateur astronomer. Uh, spent many hundreds of hours searching for comets without success. 
and was tracking down known comets from his driveway in New Mexico when he chanced upon what would later be the hale Bop Comet just after midnight. And on the other side, uh, Thomas Bopp did not even own a telescope or I would hazard to guess a computer. Uh, he was out with friends near Stanfield, Arizona, observing star clusters and galaxies when he chanced across the comet while at the eyepiece of his friend's telescope. He realized he hmm. might have spotted something new when, like Hale, he checked his star maps to determine if any other deep sky objects were known to be near the M70 cluster, found that none were, and, uh, get this, he alerted the Central Bureau for Astronomical uh, findings with a telegram through Western Union. Yeah. Uh, Brian G. Marston, who had run the Bureau since 1968, uh, laughed in a old quote saying, nobody sends telegrams anymore. I mean, by the time that telegram got here, Alan Hale had already emailed us three times with updated coordinates. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. So, okay. Lots more interesting tidbits here. Uh, Hale Bot became visible to the naked eye in May of 1996, and as the comet approached the sun, it continued to brighten and uh, showing a growing pair of tails. One of them was a blue gas tail that uh, pointed straight straight away from the sun, and the the second one was a yellowish dust tail that uh, was curving away along its orbit. Interestingly, on March 9th, a solar eclipse in China, Mongolia, and eastern Siberia allowed observers to, there to see the comet during the daytime. Uh, Hale Bob had his, his closest approach to the Earth on March 22nd, 1997, at a distance of 1.315 AU, which AU is uh, astronomical units, which is about 150 million kilometers or 93 million miles. Um, it had originally been conceived as the average distance of the Earth's ap apelion and perihelion, which more definitions. Um, the apelion is the furthest distance from the sun, and the perihelion is the closest distance to the sun. So anyways, uh, yeah, 1.315 uh, astronomical units away. So, actually, pretty damn close. It shone brighter than any star in the sky except for Cirrus, and its dust tail stretched for about 45 to, uh, 40 to 45 degrees across the sky, which is fucking giant, giant, ginormous. Uh, the last naked eye observations were reported in December 1997, which meant that the comet had remained visible without aid for 569 days or about 18 and a half months. Wow. So ev every night, except for like uh, some time in December when it was, uh, there was problems. I forget what the, the actual issue was, but anyways, um, the, the previous record had been set by the great comet of 1811, which was visible to the naked eye for only nine months. The internet was a growing phenomenon at the time and numerous websites that tracked the comet's progress and provided daily images from around the world became extremely popular. Um, and yeah, the, the net played a huge role in encouraging the unprecedented public interested in the, uh, comet hail pop. And now for the super interesting kind of gross, kind of weird, kind of scary part. Uh, so yeah, hail bop. Um, you might've heard about heaven's gate and there were, for about 40 people who were part of this cult down in San Diego who uh, committed mass suicide as the comet came close to Earth. Weird as fuck, right? Yeah, and guess where I was when they did that? Seven miles uh, away in Oceanside. Nice. Yeah, yeah. Yeah, this article says they're in San Diego. They're actually north of San Diego away, a ways, but uh, in, the, this, in San Diego County for sure. I, I actually didn't uh, find out where they were based out of. Yeah, it was yeah. all over the local news there. Oh, yeah. I, I remember, I really remember that part. I mean, sure, the, the comet, I remember that being in the sky, but Heaven's Gate, wow. That was that was the big one. Mm-hmm. <laughs> People kind of comparing that to Jonestown and shit. Yeah. Yeah, it was. They were going to ride the comet. 
shed themselves of their earthly vessels <laughs> and then join the spaceship. Yeah, that, that's some weird fucking shit. Kind of sounds sci- like Scientology to me. You know. But, um, you know, there was a little bit of credence to that claim uh, in the conspiracy circles, at least, because there was this guy that uh, was taking pictures of the comet and for whatever reason, there was a defect or whatever, but it looked like to him, one of his pictures had a ship next to the comet. So he thought there was a, a ship hiding in the comet's tail so that it wouldn't be seen while it was, you know, coming close to earth. Ooh. Yeah. So, oh, weird, and, and weird nutters where they were was Rancho Santa Fe. Hmm. Well, not Rancho Cookie Manga, huh? Okay. No, no. Hmm. Yeah. Mm-mm-mm. Pretty wild. <laughs> so, yeah. Um, 18 months. Fucking hell. Yeah. I, I first saw it shortly before we got down to Oceanside uh, from Baker, California. Mm-hmm. And it either wasn't viewable in the Northwest or at least it was too cloudy that winter. Mm. Um, that was the year of the New Year's flood of 1997 where Grants Pass got its annual, average annual rainfall in the month of January. Well, uh, to be fair, I mean, if you think about our rotation around the sun and like all the planets, basically, basically, uh, it's kind of flat. They don't really want Mm -hmm. warble up and down. Whereas, uh, hail bop was fairly nearly perpendicular to our, uh, rotation around the sun. Oh, okay. So, you know, towards, you know, for the last few months, it was actually only visible basically down in the Southern Hemisphere. Wherever it is, you would only be able to see it if it's above you at night. Yeah. 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 But yeah, fucking I. I mean, that, and their find was like a one in a million. I mean, amateur, amateur telescope operators shouldn't have been able to find that, but wow, they got lucky as all hell. Mm hmm. So that's what I got. All right. Well, after a quick break, we'll be back with science and technology. We love hearing from our listeners. You can email us at contact at atheistnomads.com, tweet us at atheistnomads, send us a message on our Facebook page at facebook.com slash atheistnomads, or better yet, call us and leave us a message at 541-203-0666. We might even play it on the show. You can also help us out by leaving us a review on iTunes, Stitcher, or your podcast directory of choice. Lauren prepped all these articles, and unfortunately she's not uh, here with us, but I will uh, I will be covering in her absence. Uh, the Deep Space Climate Observatory's camera, also known as Earth Polychromatic Imaging Camera, or EPIC, returns its first pictures of the whole Earth from one million miles away. It's beautiful. Yeah. I got that as my wallpaper now. <laughs> Not since man was on the moon has there been a picture taken of the whole Earth. And back then it was Apollo 17 that took the famous blue marble photo. Needless to say, this photograph is much higher resolution and has incredible detail, including the Cerulean Caribbean, Central America, and some of the South and North American continents. It's the first of a series of photos to be taken to better enable scientists to understand climate and weather. And it is out far enough from Earth that it's in that spot where it's balanced between uh, the Earth and Sun's gravity and centrifugal force of orbit. So it'll be able to do amazing work uh, looking at what kind of solar radiation the Earth is getting, what kind of solar winds there are, as well as take all kinds of pictures of what's going on in Earth's atmosphere. All I can say is it's got amazing fucking detail. Yeah. The, yeah. Yeah, it really does. <laughs> the, the link to the pictures in the show notes. Nice. And Pluto has a tail like a comet. As Pluto's nitrogen atmosphere gets stripped away by solar winds, what's left behind is a comet-like tail, befitting of a planet that, that a famous cartoon dog was named after. <laughs> there has also been found a frozen area inside the now famous heart region, uh, Tombo's region, made up of carbon dioxide. Many of the features seen by 
New Horizons flyby have been unofficially named, including Cthulhu, <laughs> Balrog, and many gods and goddesses of the dead. I just saw an overlay of Pluto the dog's face on there, and it fits quite well. <laughs> uh, <laughs> and, finally, a single-cell organism with a complex eyeball? Well, possibly. <laughs> The Warnoweed is a single-celled algae that seems to have evolved an eyeball using some surprising cellular parts. Mitochondria make up a sheath that acts like a cornea, directing in light towards the lens and retina. The retina-like area is made up of bacterial bodies and algal plastids. Did this creature's ancestor eat some algae and retain the plastids, as well as some bacteria for good measure? much like how we kept mitochondria. Either way, these placids are now probably working as the sensory organelle. And I say probably because they don't know for sure what it does. <laughs> they have well, found that it has a lot of, of uh, photosynthetic uh, properties, more so that or, they have found that it has a lot of chlorophyll, more so than the rest of the algae does. And this is a, a class of algae that has uh, mostly abandoned photosynthesis in favor of eating prey, little microscopic I'm prey. Well, I'm sure that, you know, Mr. B, he will make an announcement sometime very soon and explain it. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. That, oh, it's it's so complex that God must have made it all at once. Obviously. <laughs> Despite the fact that there are genes in some of those little parts of the organelle. Hmm. genes that differ than the nuclear DNA. <laughs> and we're going to take another quick break, and then we will be back with politics and religion. As a listener of the show, I'm going to assume you love my sexy vocal stylings. If you love the rest of the show as much as my voice, consider giving us the resources we desperately need to purchase quality cocaine and Red Bull. We make it super easy to make a one-time donation or to support us on a per-episode monthly or even annual basis using PayPal or Patreon. Find out more at atheistnomads.com. Use the links on the right side of the page. A dollar an episode is all we ask. Hey, we're going to start off with some good news. All right. Uh, unfortunately, it's all downhill from there. Oh, no. The Equal Employment Opportunity Commission, which has jurisdiction with federal employment complaints, provides mediation for private employees and employer complaints, and will go to court on behalf of private employees that they rule have been wronged, has issued a ruling that sexual orientation discrimination is already illegal under Title VII of the Civil Rights Act of 1964. The rationale is based on a Supreme Court ruling that the prohibition of discrimination includes irrational sex stereotyping. As such, discrimination against a butch lesbian or effeminate gay man are based on stereotypes of what it means to be a woman or a man, just like how it's a stereotype that women should be in relationships with men and men with women. So discriminating based on who someone loves or has mm -hmm. sex with is also just forcing a stereotype on someone. And as Dan Savage says, homophobia is just misogyny's little brother. Mm. And it's big brother. And yeah, when you break it down like that, it is like, well, duh. <laughs> <laughs> you know, whenever you just play the name game and things just seem to pop out at you really easy. You're like, would you do this to a black person? Would you do this? To like, no, you wouldn't. And it's just ugly. Yeah. yeah. Mm. If enough courts started ruling on this uh, ruling in line with the EOC's ruling, then we could have a case where the whole entire LGBT community could already be protected everywhere. How can I? <laughs> this has some awesome potential uh, for a bill that has some horrifying potential. Uh, Representative Raul Labrador, Republican from Idaho, and Senator Mike Lee, Republican from Utah have introduced legislation to specifically protect persons and corporations, whether for-profit or not, from any kind of, quote, discriminatory action based on their beliefs about marriage being between one man 
and one woman, or that sex should only happen within such a marriage. The main goal of this bill would be to protect anti-gay bigots, but it would also protect those who fire single women for getting pregnant. We cover stories of schools and businesses doing this every now and then, but it's worth noting that explicitly religious organizations such as churches and church-run schools should be free to discriminate against employees who do not live up to their standards, as long as those standards are applied equally. For example, my alma mater, Milo Adventist Academy, should be free to only hire and retain staff who are good Adventists in good standing. Where this goes too far, well, other than the fact that that all those standards need to be applied equally to everyone and not disproportionately against only women. Uh, but where this bill in itself goes too far is that it protects federal contractors very explicitly and all other people in businesses. Federal tax money should not be going to, to, to support discriminatory organizations. And a lot of organizations, such as businesses of public accommodation and hospitals, since they may be the only one in town, should not be able to discriminate. No disagreement there. Yeah, this this bill is <laughs> utter bullshit. It's it's trying to because like in theory, it's it's there to protect Catholic schools, but mm. no, no, no. Uh, they're all ready to free to do that as long as they're doing it equally. It really is just there to allow people to discriminate against gays and lesbians. Uh, women are just going to end up being the possibly unintended victims in this. Uh, I, I don't see this ending up very good for anybody unless you're like white and male. And that's not a good either. White, male, and Christian. Yeah. Preferably, preferably rich. Yeah. Yeah. And preferably with children already. All right. And it, it just keeps getting worse. <laughs> what, what did you what did you think about my uh where I where I draw the line between when it's shitty but okay to discriminate and when it's not? You know, if if a church wants to run their 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 place the way they want to, I suppose that's all right. Uh, but I would also say that they should give up their tax exempt status so that they can discriminate, discriminate against who they want to. Um, basically if you want to discriminate against a protected class of people, which should be everybody, mm -hmm. um, then yeah, fucking lose your, lose your tax exempt and then you can fucking do it if you want to. Now see that I, I think that is goes against the spirit of separation of church and state. I think there should be a punishment for it. It should either be nobody gets a tax exempt status or the state, because the state needs to stay neutral in matters of doctrine sure. and practice. Uh, well, the churches in my example, they're free to discriminate, but they're also, if they're going against the law of discriminating, discriminating against somebody or some group, then you know what? Fine. But, you know, one side scratches the other's back. And if you want to break the law, then, you know, don't expect to get your back scratched. Yeah. And see, I think that's wrong. Like, I think it's 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 a funny story to talk about the the Mormons changing their their doctrine on blacks because of yeah. pressure from the IRS. Yeah. I don't think the IRS had any right to do that. Mm. If. if because in a perfect he, he, world, they shouldn't have tax exempt status yeah, at all. Anyways. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. But you know what? So long as we're doing that, uh, then they need to play by the rules. The The problem with that, though, is, is whose rules? And the, na the nations. But the problem there is the, the whole point of separation of church and state, you keep the state out of interfering with church doctrine and you keep the church out of trying to interfere with state policy. That is has definitely broken down a lot, uh, at least as far as the church interfering with the state. But for that principle to have any meaning, there cannot be financial strings attached to anybody's uh, beliefs or, or religious practices. I mean, the nation does it, or at least is supposed to do it, when, uh, you know, the pastor is 
talk about their uh, their political beliefs or elected because person. That is part of of that wall that's trying to keep the church out of playing in trying to keep the church separate from the state. Right, but there's laws against it. Because it would be the church playing too heavily in, in state affairs. And th- they're okay, but there's a law against it. It's on the books. So Because it would be it would violate the principle it violates the principle of, of church state that. separation. I get that, but I'm saying there's a law and then there's also a law for discrimination against dis- discrimination. So if a church breaks that, you know, punish them the same way. Which, you know, this the standard, if you want to talk about which candidate to elect from your pulpit, you're supposed to lose your taxes exempt. But that standard <laughs> is because electioneering from the pulpit mm-hmm. breaks the wall of, of church-state separation. Being a discriminatory asshole doesn't. Okay, both are laws, though. But one is following in the spirit of the First Amendment, and the other, if applied... And if applied to churches, does not. Because mm-hmm. the First Amendment overrides all laws. Free exercise needs to include uh, a, a church being a discrimi- discriminating jackass. Mm-hmm. And I include religious schools in that same category because they are, granted, they do need a lot more oversight because uh, education is a... a important thing that the state has a a good interest in ensuring certain standards are met. Um, But schools are uh, church ministries and there is always a a secular alternative to them. Uh, I draw the line at hospitals, even though church owned hospitals, they view them as ministries. Ooh. Yeah. That's how they count them. Uh, They, there is so many areas where there is no other choice. Yeah. Yeah. So, like, I work in the medical field. I don't have a lot of options. Now, granted, I'm also in IT, so I could potentially move into another field. Uh, But, like, where I'm at, there's a one hospital network that owns almost everything. Yeah. Well, owns almost half of everything that (laughs) is theoretically loosely associated with the Episcopal Church, but not really anymore and is basically just a secular hospital. And then there's the Catholic Hospital. So basically a secular hospital, but are they still pumping money towards the church? I don't think so. Mm -hmm. Yeah, and then there's uh, some small uh, for-profit hospitals, but nobody really goes to them. (laughs) They're insanely expensive. Mm. They're owned by Rick Perry's former company. Not Rick Perry, uh, Rick Scott's former company. Mm. Yeah. Don't know Rick Scott. Republican governor of uh, Florida, uh, he he left the Healthcare Corporation of America because of some horrible uh, Medicare fraud cases. Right, billions of dollars in Medicare fraud, double <laughs> billing, triple billing, just making up charges. Right, like you do. All right. <laughs> well, yeah, sure. yeah. All right, but we we are getting off topic, so we're going to move on down to Arizona. <laughs> oh boy! All right. Faith Christian Church in Tucson is looking for a new home after the amphitheater public schools decided to not renew the lease that they had after completing an investigation into the church. Yay. While the district, yeah, yeah, yay. <laughs> uh, while the district is not disclosing their findings, 21 former church members describe the church as a cult which advocates spanking infants and that exercises a lot of control over members' lives and finances. And some of these former members claim to have PTSD from the church. Boo, what the fuck? (laughs) The high school's principal is also the corporate director of the church. I don't see where that could be a problem. And he would also hold prayer meetings during business hours and allow the church to move equipment with students being left to put it back during class time. Right. Yeah, yeah. And their their main recruiting target has been the University of Arizona, where they have three student groups, all of which are now on probation by the university. And the church has also been removed from the campus religious council. <laughs> which I wonder why the hell does a public university need to have a religious council 
Uh, this council has also posted warning signs around campus targeted at the group, warning their targets of, well, potential targets of manipulative practices and a technique called love bombing, where they find... I'm guessing where they just surround you with lots of loving, warming, uh, lovey-dovey feelings and then uh -huh. suck you in and then yep. treat you like shit. Well, starting with, you know, scared, vulnerable freshmen. Yeah. Yeah. And uh, the three university employees who are members of the church have been required to attend a workshop on cult dynamics. <laughs> right. Yeah. Wow. They, they, they were required to attend that because they are also the sponsors of those three student groups. Great. Yeah. Holy shit. <laughs> well, at least they're <laughs> like not at, not in the fucking high school anymore. And how did that shit get permitted in the first place? Oh, wait. Yeah. He's the principal. Mm hmm. <laughs> yeah. And they've been at that high school for over 20, well, for a long time. The church has been around for over 20 years. I'm guessing at least all of his tenure. <laughs> yeah. Hmm. Now, to me, the whole concept of renting out school facilities to churches mm -hmm. seems wrong. Yeah, These, pretty much. Yeah. That's, that's public property. And I don't think that public property should be used for any kind of religious purposes ever. It is way too easy for, well, A, weird stuff to be going on, like school employees uh, giving the church free labor from students, leaving stuff like cleaning up to school staff so they have to pick up the tab, and also just easy to leave recruiting materials there. This is a high school, a public high school. A church has no place there in any fashion. Most certainly not during the daytime. Evening, I'm halfway split on this. As long as they are actually like, you know, giving a, a proper amount of money to the, the school. But, you know, like if there is a, a tornado and their church blew down, you know, fucking give the school some money and meet in their, their, uh, cafeteria for a couple of weeks or something while they get a new church built i suppose maybe but as long as they're they're paying enough to make sure there's somebody making sure that all their shit is cleaned up before they leave sure i mean that should be in the contract no matter what the group is that does that uses the the space but yeah i would just rather not see them touch school grounds at all yeah <laughs> yeah hmm Moving on. Yep. All right. The Greater Mount Moriah Primitive Baptist Church in Tampa, Florida, has sent a new member of only six months a collection letter for not keeping up with the church's payment schedule of $50 per month, $150 on Mount Moriah Day, whatever the hell that is, and $250 for the church anniversary. I'm assuming your anniversary of joining the church. And they also let her know that her 11-year-old daughter is behind on the reduced youth fee schedule. Sure. And this makes me wonder two things. Uh, what happened to 10%? Well, I'm just wondering, this is tithing, right? That's a... Uh, no, this is I mean, it's a This sure. is membership dues. But they, the church calls it tithing. That's not. Tithe is defined as 10%. And tithe is supposed to be optional. Once it's required, uh, this church has fucking issues with, with state and federal. And yeah, she has like a over thousand dollar bill from this church. Uh, holy shit. <laughs> I remember when I saw this a, a, few, a couple days back, it just, I've, uh, you know, other people have had the same issue with this church and other people have come forward saying that, you know, other churches have done this, but this is just shysty. I mean, they're actually, like, sending your letters out. You need to pay. Uh, the the part that seems weird to me is it's, well, A, it's, it's arbitrary amounts where one of the nice things about tithe is it's at least a percentage of your income, not a flat rate, because flat rates are a lot harder on poor people than they are on rich people. And... The other thing that's weird is whatever happened to elders visiting members suspected of not ponying up? 
that's the way it used to be. I know at least back in the 80s, the Adventist church would, would keep tabs on who was paying how much in tithe. And if, if they didn't think that you were paying enough, like if they heard you had a pay increase or a new job that they thought might be making, be paying you better and didn't notice your tithe going up, they would send an elder or even the pastor to visit you in your home and find out why shake, you aren't. Shake you down. Yeah, basically. <laughs> that is some scary shit. <laughs> what the fuck yeah yeah if you want to be a, a voting member of an organization you need to pay your dues but this is just shady see now i thought that once it was be- once it became not optional to pay i thought that was against the law uh, what mm-hmm. law i'm pulling up the raw story on that one yeah i could imagine it being Against the law, if they tried to actually send her off to a collection agency, that would be, that better be illegal. But if it's pay up or, or leave. Ah, um, hmm. well, straight from, take this for what you will, straight from raw story, uh, greater Mount per- Mariah primitive Baptist church doesn't offer anything remotely like those activities that this separate nightclub had but ties must be made voluntary to remain tax deductible uh, okay that really doesn't have anything to do with that all right no and, and right. the thing with with being voluntary is membership is voluntary uh, and they didn't just say pay up or else they said pay up or you're not a member yeah hmm. every group does that to a certain extent if you don't pay your membership dues to American atheists, you don't get to keep on, keep a hold of your membership and your voting rights. But the fact they sent a collection letter just seems odd. Very, very odd. Shady. Shiesty. Mm. Yeah. And uh, on July 25, so just a few days from now, the Satanic Temple will be unveiling their Baphomet statue. Wahoo. At an as-of-yet undisclosed location. Hmm. Initially, it was going to be held at Burt's Marketplace in Detroit, but Burt Deering backed out and returned the rental fee, saying, Detroit is a very religious area. When I rented the place, I just thought it was a church. I didn't know about the unveiling of a statue. We weren't aware that there was, they were into devil worshiping. This is despite the fact that the, satanic, that the satanic temple was clearly listed on the contract. The real reason he backed out is because there have been numerous threats to burn or blow up the statue. Unfortunately, these threats were coming from people with a very poor understanding of physics, so they would really just end up burning down the venue, killing a lot of people, and possibly denting the bronze statue. (laughs) And the new location will be sent to ticket holders on the day of the event. Yeah, but it should give that statue a really nice burnished finish, though. (laughs) Yes, it would. (laughs) Oh, boy. There have been a lot of threats. Yeah, what the fuck? You can't really have a heaven and hell, a God without a Satan. I don't know. Can't have one without the other. Peanut butter and jelly? Yeah. Anyways, chocolate and peanut butter. (laughs) (laughs) Uh, Lamb and tuna fish. Mm -hmm. Uh, It's an Adam Sandler thing. Mm. Weird. Yeah. And finally... The uh, last week in Chattanooga, Tennessee, four Marines and a sailor died in a Navy Operations Support Center after Muhammad Abdulaziz gunned them down with an AR-15. So, what do we know? He shot up a recruiting station before driving to the Navy facility. Yeah. He died in a shootout with the police. Yeah. He was an Arab Muslim of Jordanian descent. Yeah. He was suffering from bipolar disorder. Oh, my. He was unhappy with the U.S. government in general and about the war on terror specifically. Don't really blame him. His family claims that he had a substance abuse problem with party drugs. Ooh. He spent some time in Jordan with the fam- with family last year and came back acting differently. That's what happens when you dry out improperly? <laughs> there is no evidence of a connection with ISIS. Okay. The DOJ is investigating as an act of terrorism. Okay. And a number of GOP governors are calling for arming service members. And there are now a bunch of private militiamen 
voluntarily standing guard in front of recruiting stations and other military installations while being asked to go home. Yeah, all all branches have already put out statements. They don't want those fucking militia people out there. Yeah. If if you're going to be okay, right after a recruiting facility and operation support center get shot up, you go to one with an assault rifle? What the fuck is wrong with you? Oh, there's a lot wrong with them. <laughs> <laughs> what uh, the fuck? Man. Okay, this kid has some serious fucking issues. No doubt about it. Um, don't get me wrong, he has some, definitely some legitimate gripes about the fucking war on terror. And the uh, government. Yeah. I mean, our government is kind of douchey sometimes. Sometimes a lot. But anyways, um, yeah, I mean, all that aside, I mean, diagnosed bipolar. <sighs> We need better gun control in our nation. I'd say that's a big thing right there. Mm-hmm. And we should probably keep guns out of people's hands that have, you know, serious mental issues. Bipolar is definitely not a small thing. Yeah, there, there is a, a significant number of mental health issues that increase the risk of a firearm being used to harm yourself or others. And It's a no-brainer that people with certain mental illnesses should probably not have access to firearms. But we also, I don't think we can, we can blame this on the bipolar. It was a contributing factor. Definitely. Uh, The fact that he's an Arab Muslim is probably a contributing factor. Yeah. There's no evidence that he had any connections with ISIS and he actually thought ISIS was doing things wrong. That doesn't mean that he was being radicalized. No. And the war on terror has radicalized a lot of Muslims. Fucking A. Like we creating ISIS. Oh, yeah. Well, I mean, ISIS is because we fucked up in Iraq, in Iraq mm-hmm. and, you know, basically kicked their army out, the, the high-level army. They went over and formed ISIS. Yeah. We created Al-Qaeda in Iraq, and Al-Qaeda in Iraq, in Iraq became ISIS. The substance abuse, I I doubt, is a factor. Party drugs aren't likely to be... Did he smoke weed? Did he take E? Probably, maybe. I'm guessing. Smoked Party weed, drugs. yes. Uh, some E, probably, yeah. Uh, but Maybe, sure, maybe. But neither of those are going to make you fuck shit up like this. No. And actually, uh, that kind of sounds more like he was trying to treat his bipolar himself. And self-medicating is... Not a very good idea. Yeah, no. <laughs> the uh, the the time he spent in Jordan, uh, I spent time in Jordan. I get coming back acting differently after that. I grant I, I did. I spent two weeks in in Mexico after my time in Jordan. But you could people could say that I came back acting a lot differently. I was drinking and not a Christian anymore. <laughs> it's a different culture with a lot of different values. And that can change people. I went to Japan. I act differently now. And we have, no, but we have no idea what the family he was staying with was like. Most Jordanians are nice, peaceful people, but most people in Jordan are not actually Jordanian anymore. Hmm. It's a majority refugee country now. Fuck. <laughs> Between the Palestinians, Iraqis, and Syrians. It's a country with a lot of problems, and, well, especially if you consider that ISIS was effectively created by the U.S. government when we fucked up in Iraq, uh, uh, Jordan has a whole lot of refugees and a whole lot of economic problems caused by those refugees that they can blame the U.S. government on and the war on terror on. You know, um... You could say this was a terrorist act if you want to, but I think that's really most likely stretching it way too far than it should be. Uh, but in another shooting thing, I actually just wanted to mention this, uh, the Charleston shooting suspect, uh, Dylan Roof, mm-hmm. uh, he's to be in- indicted on federal hate crime charges, which is awesome. Nice. You know, that 
I would definitely say that should be listed as a terrorist act, but at least he's being tried as uh, this is being tried as a hate crime. Yeah. And, and of course, what this, this seems to come down to again and again is if you're white, it's a hate crime. If you're brown, uh, if, it's terrorism. If you're white, it's a murder. If you're brown, it's terrorist. You know, this is the first time I've seen in a long time something that would be called a hate crime. I mean, every Fox News reporter was calling this, you know, just a, a lone, sad incident. Yeah. But, and personally, I, I, I don't think there's much of a worthy distinction between hate crimes and terrorism because the purpose of a hate crime is to terrorize a specific group. The purpose of terrorism is to terrorize a population. Exactly. I'd, yeah. I'd say scale ish, but it still has the same effect. Yeah. <laughs> Man, that kid has dead eyes. Oh, I the guess fucking... the, the one thing we know that I, I left out is that he died in a shootout with police at the end. Oh, yeah. If you're white, you're going to live. If, you, if you're black, you're fucked. Or brown. Sorry. Yeah. Yeah. yeah, Dylan Roof, still alive. Now, that's a sad, depressing note. We have feedback. All right. It was a very, after getting a lot of good feedback the last few episodes, yeah. uh, it was really quiet. Yep, yep. But from yeah, Jasmine Lay at Pixie Chixie 36 at Atheist Nomads, you all mentioned me. Yay, I posted a link to your show in the, in the, or I posted a link to your show on In the Name of God, the podcast Facebook page. Yay. And if well, it's, thank you. If it's In the Name of God, the podcast, it should be the In the Name of God, the podcast, the Facebook page. Then you should make a breakfast cereal about it. Yep. And yeah. call it the cereal. Yes. With all of the others, with, you know, the does in front and of the, it. And then you could make a, a small comic about it and then you could have a, a cereal. On the cereal box. Oh, nice. Ooh, thank you. Anyway, if you want to get in touch with us, you can email us at contact at atheistnomads.com. Call us at 541 203 0666. Hit us up on Facebook, facebook.com slash atheistnomads, or tweet us at atheistnomads. All right. And we have no new patrons this week. No? No. But we do want to thank all of our supporters. And don't forget to use that Amazon click through because fucking it costs you nothing and we'll see a little bit of scratch and we won't even know what sex toys that you bought. And I'll just assume it was or all wait, Wesley. That's me. Yeah. Yeah. It, yeah. And if, if you want to support us, you can. As my girlfriend sits next to me and chuckles. <laughs> <laughs> if you want to support us, you can hit up our, our website and uh, click on the PayPal links or go to patreon.com slash atheist nomads. All right. And that's all we have for this week. Uh, we'll be back in a week with an interview. Badass. Thank you for listening to another episode of Atheist Nomads. You can find us online at www.atheistnomads.com. Contact us at contact at atheistnomads.com or leave us a voicemail message at 541 203 You can also like us on Facebook or leave us a review on iTunes, Zoom, or wherever else you find the podcast. Until next time, this has been The Atheist Nomad. The DOG is investigating it as an act of terrorism. DOJ. Did I say DOG? Yeah. <laughs>